I'm Matt Gray, and I'm joined weekly by Dr. J. We're both certified financial planners, and we talk about how child-free life impacts your finances. This is Child-Free Life and Money. Hello again, Matt Gray here, joined by Dr. J on the Child-Free Life and Money podcast. Today, we're talking about an ever-confusing topic that is changing what seems like constantly. We're talking about how to choose a financial planner and the fact that the industry is changing quite a bit right now, and so how it can get confusing quickly. We're going to see if we can sift through some of the confusion and hopefully provide some clarity uh, on this front. And this might be one of the times, Dr. J, that you and I are very much so aligned, whereas normally we're, we're mostly aligned. But I think today we'll be pretty much on the same page. We'll have to see. Uh, how, well, we how have some different out. structures and different concepts of it. Let's call it that. True. But I th- fair. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, with that, then let's dive into it. But before we get too far in, let's kind of define um, some basic things before we get into this conversation, because the landscape's quite confusing as it already is. So let's talk about the the different titles we hear out there. There's like financial consultant, financial advisor, financial planner. What do they all mean? Is there a difference or investment advisor even? Um, We can talk about those a little bit. We'll also talk about how your advisor gets paid. But let's first start with with just the the names of uh, financial professionals and what they mean. So let's cover some of the basics. Uh, What's the difference between a financial planner, investment advisor, financial advisor, any of those, like what, what do those bring to mind for you? Actually, let me ask you a question first, Matt. When do I need to actually even think about hiring one of those people? All right, that's fair. Yeah, let's rewind it even further. Good, that's, that's fair. Uh, there are a number of reasons that you'd want to hire a, a financial planner. And I find for, for child-free people, um, it's generally not time, but sometimes they are busy doing whatever they want to be doing as opposed to managing their money. So if you're very busy, uh, for people who just get a promotion, people who are getting married, uh, people or maybe people getting involved with more of a group situation, whether it's Golden Girls style, a group romantic situation. Um, maybe there are new members, not to their immediate family, but maybe in their extended family, new nieces and nephews that they want to get involved somehow. There's all kinds of things that would would lead to that moving states or maybe moving out of the country, all kinds of things. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, by the way, you can do it on your own. I mean, let's be real. You could pick up some books and read it, and you know, you could pick up Simple Path to Wealth, you know, a little common, a little book, Common Sense Investing. You could do most investing stuff pretty easily. Taxes make everything more challenging. Mm-hmm. You know, if you got anything complex with taxes, options, stock options, things like that, problem. Um, also, I, I had I had a prospect say it this way: I want to know what my unknown unknowns are. And ooh, that was a good one for let me get some help there. But I think the other part of it is um, I'm a bit more on the behavioral side saying, look, if, if you're happy with where, what you've gotten from your money and happy with the progress you made, great. If you aren't, what's going to change? And right. the answer is I got to bring somebody in to help me out. Correct. Um, and, and couples in particular, that, that could be an issue. Others, it's what, what, how do I get to that next step? And mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be, hey, I need somebody for life or, you know, um, you know, they have to have a spare bedroom in my house and, you know, I have to, they move in with me. But I think people hear financial advisors and all, all these terms and like, and you'll see it. I saw it on the Facebook group. Oh, you never need one of those. Okay, sure. That's fine. Um, and part of it is because let's be real, Matt, some of our uh, financial brethren have not done so well True. Uh, yeah. in, in, treat, in taking care of people. But I, the way I look at it is the U.S. Um, education system is terrible with financial literacy. You know, the Correct. only thing I was taught in high school is how to balance a checkbook, which is a giant waste of time. Yeah. <laughs> so you have the rest of your life to learn how to manage money because you're going to be managing it for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. You just have to choose. Do you want to learn on your own or do you want to learn with help? Correct. Those are your options. Right. I mean, there's, there's lots of variations behind that. But the question is, where do you want to go? I think I tell all my clients. So I, I have a monthly retainer. We'll get back to the, the structures. But my monthly retainer is 500 bucks a month. Not cheap. I say to them, if you're not getting $500 of value, you should fire me. You, know, you should be getting value from your financial planner. Correct. If you're not, you need to move on. Uh, and I think the challenge there is most people have blind spots they don't know mm-hmm. and where places they can improve and do that. And and I think some people don't reach out to financial planners because they're worried, well, they're going to judge me, whatever. Yeah, this is not 
Ooh, you you had an extra latte. You're in trouble. No, this mm. is, it's about how do we get you to your goals. Um, and I think if you can do it on your own, great. At some point, you'll probably get to a limit. That's okay. Call call yeah, old school. Phone a friend for help. Remember mm-hmm. that show? Yeah. Um, that's when you can phone a friend for help. I mean, it's it's not that everybody needs a financial planner, and it's not that nobody needs a financial planner. It's about having the right amount of help that you need. Completely agree. And I think some people have uh, instances, I think it's hard to have that blanket advice of, oh, you, everyone needs one, everyone doesn't. Like, that's an impossible thing, which is to your point on the Facebook groups or whatever, when you see people say, you don't need one, you'll be fine. You're like, well, you don't know what their situation is, matter of fact. Uh, so maybe you, you may not know. Or if someone's like, oh, you should definitely hire someone. You're like, again, you don't really know their situation. So maybe they don't need to hire someone at this point. Uh, so I think that is a good clarification to understand that it really depends on your situation. Typically what you find more complexity or more time that you're putting into your finances, the more likely you're going to need one. But I think your point about unknowns or unknown unknowns, I also call them minefields, uh, financial services, or not even services, but finance as a whole and the US tax code can be a minefield. Um, so just helping to, to be your guide through that minefield is uh, pretty valuable as well. So uh, yeah, the very simple things, less likely to get in trouble more complex things, like you mentioned stock options and you're, you're flirting with danger if you don't have someone to help you out. Uh, so I think it's a good clarification as to when, um, I think, you know, Dr. J, you offer a free consultation. I have introductory meetings where they're, they're free as well, where people can just come to me. Uh, and I'm not sure what you do exactly, Dr. J. You can, can let us know in a second, but I will tell someone fairly early on if I'm someone who can help them or if I'm the best person to help them. Um, because oftentimes someone will come to me and just say, hey, just got my first job. I'm making, you know, 52,000 a year and I've got 75,000 in student loans. And I just started last week. And I'd say, I'm probably not the best person to help you admittedly. And there are probably other people that, that may be better uh, for suited for that specific situation or something else. Do you do something similar to like help guide people as to where they can go to get help if they want it? Um, or is it like fairly easy to approach you and, and get, get a little bit of help that way? Yeah. So the way I do it, um, my, in my intro meeting, is let's just get to know each other, see sure. what's going on. I always try to see if there's one or two things I can help people with. You know, they have, you know, emergency. Because it's funny. People only reach out to financial planners when either something great happened or something bad happened, it seems to be. Right. Like something in their life has occurred. So I usually try to bring down the anxiety level on that. And you know what? Not everybody fits. That's okay. Not everybody right. can afford it. That's okay. Um, I try to point them towards uh, resources. I joke, but it's true. Everybody gets homework after every time they meet with me. You know, here's some articles read, here's some things to dig in. Um, But it's just a matter of getting on the right path. And I think what I find is for many, it's their first time they've had a conversation about money. Right. Like actually put words to it. Right. You know, and and that can be a challenge. Sure. Uh, And then it's a matter of organizing that and going, okay, here's where we start. Here's the next steps. And here's where we go. So... I mean, we've mentioned that it's fairly easy to approach either of us about it with no obligations, no cost up front or anything like that. You could just come to us and say, hey, this is my problem. You know, I kind of want to learn more about you. I'm thinking about hiring a financial planner or something, someone to help me with these things. Maybe they've gotten out over that decision where they need to. Um, and, and they're starting to look. But it, speaking of minefields, uh, finding a financial planner or a financial advisor or a, an investment advisor or a financial consultant which one am I looking for? Like, where do I even go? Where do I start? There's so many different titles out there. How do I know which one's the best one and for what I need? Yeah. So a couple of things on this. If somebody says they are an investment advisor, actually investment advisor representative or a registered investment advisor, they've actually filed and registered with either their state or the SEC. This is in the US only. Um, and they can serve people in other states depending on the, the numbers, but they have registered and they've proven they've either passed certain exams or they've got a CFP, they are an investment advisor. So let's start with that. They've actually got a duty to you. They've set up a company. They've got a fiduciary duty. They have a a purpose. Now, when you get into this other world of, well, I'm a financial advisor, I'm a financial coach, I'm a financial therapist. uh, I learned one the other way, uh, a finfluencer. It's an influencer, Mm -hmm. finance. That's nice. That's good. I like you know, that. <laughs> all these, I was like, oh, okay. All right. All of those are not like titles that are tested or have a certain 
thing we have is you can call yourself financial coach tomorrow. Just cuz. You just got my business card. That's all. You're yep. good. Financial advisor, same thing. Um, you'll see a lot of people that sell insurance call themselves financial advisors or other things. So some of the terms become important. A certified financial planner is somebody who has passed the CFP exam. I can see it behind Matt. He's got his you know, shiny right there. See? Um, you know, then you have to have to have a CFP, you have to have a bachelor's degree, you have to have special classes, you have to pass an exam, you have to have six thousand hours experience, or you know, and you have to uh, have an ethics and background. There's a whole lot to it, mm -hmm. right? And and not everybody can call themselves a CFP. Uh, so that that's one of the things to look for is that certified financial planner, because they're the people that are trained to do financial planning. Now, the the other thing you'll see is that financial people. I swear, just want to have enough initials after their name that it wraps around their card. Okay. Yeah. Mine says PhD CFP. Okay. I have a PhD in adult learning. That's actually where I spend most of my time is teaching people. And then the CFP is on the financial side. Um, the All the letters, you're going to have to Google most of them because most of them aren't going to matter. But it's a matter of finding somebody that is doing what you want. Now, if you don't have the money to work with a financial planner, um, you could work with a financial coach, but be careful. You get what you pay for it. You never know. But there are nonprofit financial counseling, financial coaching services out there. Go with the nonprofits. Um, and there also are financial therapists for those more on the therapy side. Those, those are a slightly different world. But, the, you know, we're talking today about financial planners and financial planning as a concept. Does that make sense, Matt? Yeah, I think that's great. And we'll dive into this a little bit more. But it, it basically sounds like you're almost looking for qualifications more than you're looking for titles because titles outside of a couple are fairly fluid. Anyone can kind of just use them. They're not protected in any way. You don't have to have a license to call yourself a financial coach necessarily or anything like that. Um, are there any different roles? I mean, I know we just kind of said that titles don't matter too much, but if I were to say here, here are three people, one's a financial coach, one's a financial planner, and one is a portfolio manager or something like that how would you say those three differ in like maybe 30 seconds each really quickly? Yeah. And you and I may have slightly different pictures. So sure. When you hear investment managers or portfolio managers, they're usually more on your investments. Mm -hmm. that, that's probably pretty obvious. And you may actually see some other certifications, CFA, a few others that are more on that. You know, mm -hmm. Let's get, let's get every penny out of your investments. Right. The financial planner, a certified financial planner should be working on a comprehensive financial plan, which is, you know, soup to nuts. That's everything, um, which includes investments, but it also includes insurance and, you know, money and life and, and estate planning and all of it. All of it. Financial coaches tend to work more on behaviors. And if they're not an investment advisor, they cannot give investment advice. So that's kind of like a, a, a limited limit there. Right. Um, I call myself both a coach and a planner, depending on the day. Um, my coaching hat tends to be more on the behavioral or learning side. And my planner hat tends to be more on the math side is the way I look at it. Um, to my clients, there's no difference. Mm. Uh, but, you know, it's a different way of looking at it. Not all planners do coaching and mm -hmm. not all coaches do planning. Mm -hmm. um, and not everybody else does investment management. So they're, they're slightly different. Mm -hmm. But people think, oh, I, want, I need somebody to handle my investments. The investments are the easy part. Correct. It's the yeah. rest of the stuff that becomes yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you really nailed it uh, in terms of the descriptions. I don't think really differ. I think financial coach, just face value. Uh, I think, you know, PhD in adult learning kind of sets you aside in a number of ways, but a financial coach typically um, and broad strokes here aren't going to have all these letters after their name necessarily. Um, they're probably going to be more people who are focused on behavior, habit setting, uh, things like that, which is all very important in financial planning, something like even saving or learning to like little systems to encourage you to have good behaviors, things like that. And those are often really good. Financial coaches are great when you're like, I don't have a ton of money, but I know I kind of do silly things. Like sometimes I'll, you know, I'll run up a credit card debt a little bit or something like that. And they'll help you form habits typically to not do silly things like that and learn how to work with your money more so. Uh, to your point, Dr. J, financial planners, I would say more of like the comprehensive, they're looking at everything together, the relationships between them, and would definitely say they're more kind of math based, or maybe not even math, but just technical. Um, they're going to engineer a good plan for you uh, to make the numbers work. And they are getting a bit better now part of the curriculum for certified financial planners. There are behavioral aspects as well, as it's becoming more and more important. 
as I just said, habits are very important uh, within financial planning. So we're going to see more and more of that. Uh, but I know when I took the exam, that was not a component of it. Um, and then, yeah, investment managers, like we said, that's kind of the easy part. So if you see someone who's just a portfolio manager, investment advisor, uh, or I should say investment manager, they're not bad to, to help do financial planning necessarily, but they're not necessarily good either. So be, be aware of that. So, okay, we basically said that titles necessar don't necessarily matter. There are a few that kind of come in little clusters of areas that they could be. I hold myself out as a financial planner. You said you hold yourself out as coach and financial planner kind of in, in those arenas. Um, so we've mentioned some certifications, certified financial planner being the key one. What other maybe characteristics of someone that you're talking to or looking to hire as a financial planner or whatever fits your needs, what are some of the questions that you should be asking them or characteristics you're looking for uh, when, when you talk to them? Or you know, what, what are some things you want to have uh, in your financial planner? Yeah, we'll get to the technical terms in a minute, but let's talk about the, the kind of bigger question. And the bigger question is fit. Okay, Correct. And this is one that you're not going to be able to put your finger on, but yeah. you'll know. Um, I encourage everybody, when they're reaching out to a financial planner, talk to two to three. Um, by the way, if you're child-free, always ask, how does my financial plan differ because I'm child-free? And if they go, well, what if you change your mind? You just keep going. Or if they go, well, it doesn't matter. Just keep going. Yeah. Um, but it's about somebody that can help you learn and improve your finances. If they cannot help you learn or they, you know, like they're, they're like, oh, they pull all the, the, the fancy financial terms and you're like trying to baffle you with their bullshit. You know what I mean? You know, let's, yeah. let's call it out. Then what happens is that's not somebody you want. Correct. That's the reality of it. If they can't help you learn. Right. If, if you think, you know, if they're going to create you a big old book planner and just drop it on your desk and, you know, like, cool, I'll put that on my bookshelf. That's a waste of money. It's mm -hmm. got to be somebody that's going to help you move forward. Mm -hmm. And and it's got to be about you. You know, so if, if they don't fit you, that's okay. Move on to the next one. You know, there are some clients, Matt and I will pass clients back and forth, different fit. That's okay. doesn't matter. Right. You know, just somebody connects better. That's okay. Right. Um, you know, and there are financial planners that specialize in all types of niches. So Matt and I happen to specialize in child-free, but- there are people who specialize in engineers or whatever else. And if that's a better fit for you, cool. As long as they understand why being child-free makes a difference. So it's kind of, you know, which, which of these characteristics that I have is the biggest one that I want right. to match right? Um, to go with it. Exactly. Yeah. I think what we find that, that niches really are becoming quite common and they're getting very focused. And because we can all meet clients virtually and that's the norm now, you know, I know there's a firm that helps uh, doctors who have graduated or are going to graduate from their, or like get through their residency, some medical doctors specifically, uh, through the residency or within like a year of the residency. Uh, and that's the only pe new clients they bring on. And so you're thinking, wow, they're that specific that they know exactly what life is like for people within plus or minus a year of finishing residency or people who are only advisors to Air Force, former Air Force pilots or something like that. It gets very specific. So you're starting to say like, oh, well, like you said, Dr. J, I am child free, but also a former Air Force pilot. Which one's more critical to your financial situation at this point? We can't make that decision for you. But um, yeah, you'll start to see that you'll, there are a number of advisors who could probably suit your needs. But I think that's a really good point uh, overall when you're when you're referring to finding a fit, because I it's one of the first things I say is you should actually like your financial planner a little bit, too. You're going to have the fit from a professional perspective, their expertise, et cetera, but also the fit of I don't dread you know, chatting with them for an hour. And in your case, an hour every month, in my case, a little bit less frequently than that. But it's something I'm looking forward to. I'm going to get value out of it. And I, you know. It's not nails on a chalkboard or anything. I like what they have to, to add. So I think those are really big components that, like you said, don't get into anything really too technical at this point in terms of jargon or anything, but are really key components of continuing that relationship with someone who's going to hold you accountable. Yeah. So let's talk about the, the technical. Let's talk about the terms. So I'm going to make you you define these, Matt. So Perfect. Matt and I have mostly the same terms, and then we have a slightly different business spin. So we'll talk about we'll talk the ones we're together. So we are both fee-only fiduciary certified financial planners. Correct. What does that mean in, in like regular language? All right. So fee-only means that the only people who pay us 
are our clients. So you pay a fee directly to me. If you were my client, I don't get commissions. I don't get incentives for putting you in a certain investment. Uh, I don't get any kind of compensation from an investment company who says, oh, put your clients in my funds and I'll give you, you know, 1% kickback or something. I get nothing like that. All I get is the fee that my clients pay me, which means I'm 100% tied to my clients. They're the people who I work for and I represent them and help them in navigating this financial minefield we've already discussed a little bit of basically saying you're my only priority and that's exactly it. So fee only means you're the only one paying me. Now to further that going on to fiduciary, they kind of work uh, hand in hand, which is often why you kind of hear that said oftentimes it's one word, fee only fiduciary. It's just one word sometimes. Fiduciary means that I have a legal obligation to my clients to put their interest ahead of my own. So if there's a decision that's going to help my client's finances that will actually hurt me, make me have to work on a Saturday or whatever it is where I can't, you know, do something or it, it takes money out of my pocket somehow, I still need to legally advise them to do that thing if it's in their best interest, literally putting their interests and their best outcome ahead of my own. Now, Luckily, when you are fee only and you are, you know, intentionally working on behalf of your clients, the whole point of working in that capacity is to align yourself with the needs of your client as much as possible and to say, we win together if we win. And I don't have to make a decision most of the time between saying, oh, this is going to help you, but hurts me. The way we've built being fee only and fiduciaries, we try to limit that. So we're always working together. So that's the, the big components of fee only and fiduciary and those working together. So we truly are servants to you only. We have no other servants or uh, of masters that we're serving in any way. So that's those two. The last is the certified financial planner, which we've talked a little bit about here already with this little designation. You explained it earlier in the show here today. Uh, but very simply put, it's it's kind of the gold standard of financial planners who can say, they, like again, Dr. J said they go through insurance, investments, retirement planning, estate planning, which is like wills and trusts and things like that, um, all kinds of other aspects, tax uh, and, and various courses that require us to know enough to understand how all those things tie together and work in your situation. So for instance, though we might not be the best insurance person out there, we can work on our client's behalf speaking to an insurance person and really asking the, the pointed questions to say, well, how does this work? How does that work? And helping to uncover those unknown unknowns more easily. So when you get all of those three together, you have the technical expertise and the certified financial planner designation. You've got the fiduciary standard to where we're legally obligated to put clients' interests ahead of our own. And we're fee only continuing that, basically saying, you're our boss as our client. We have no other master to serve. So it's kind of the, the trifecta of going to be working in your best interest. Yeah, and, and now here's where Matt and I differ, which is a little bit on kind of how, we're, how we pay and how we work. So mm -hmm. um, I'm what's called an advice only, fee only fiduciary as, as Matt puts mm -hmm. one word. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the way I explain it, what I do is I teach people to do it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I don't take over their accounts. I don't do investment management, but I provide investment advice. So if you're my client, I'm going to teach you how to do it. I'll even, sh you know, look over your shoulder as you click the buttons, mm -hmm. but I don't trade for you. I don't manage your accounts. I don't take over your accounts. Um, those who like that model are people that want to can maintain control um, and want to learn how to do it themselves. Now, my hope is over time, you'll learn and it's okay if you step away from me because you've learned enough and mm -hmm. just check back with me on it. period. I normally meet with people every month. Um, and the reason why is because we can only fix one or two things at a time. We make one or two improvements. In the next month, we check back, work it through, build in some accountability for that. It's it's really a structure where you are learning and growing as you come from. That's where I come from, from learning. So that's kind of my approach. And that's called advice only. Now, Matt, you have a slightly different spin. I do. Uh, yeah, because I also offer investment management. Um not really independently on its own. I, I don't particularly offer this. You just wanted me to manage a portfolio. I will refer that out. Again, my fiduciary standard, I'm too expensive for you to do that with me. You might as well go to someone else uh, if you just need the portfolio managed. So I would probably refer you out to a different service or advisor. Uh, but with me, I my model's a little bit different than yours. 
in that I, I have that, but I also do the financial planning and my structure in terms of how I deliver that financial planning is also different from yours. So normally when a client decides to hire me, we go in and I do a soup to nuts financial plan. So something that might take, and I don't want to put time frames on this, so this is just a guess, but maybe something that takes you six or nine, maybe even a year, like six months, nine is 12 months for you to get through. I immediately knock that out as fast as possible, which admittedly is a lot more overwhelming for a lot of clients. It is a, I don't have the giant stack of paper that I drop on the desk. Uh, I do have a PDF that's <laughs> relatively relatively small, uh, but I, I kind of give them all this advice at once and then I help them implement that. And that's typically what takes me over the next six or nine or 12 months is I've looked at it all and said, these are the improvements we need to make. Let's start making them. Uh, and so in doing that, there's that original plan we build. We make all the adjustments. We make uh, quite a bit of improvements in the first year. And then it's less of the I mean, I, if I have clients who want to learn how to do it on their own, I tell people that like you probably shouldn't hire me forever, but as much as you want to learn, I'll teach you um, to, to do this yourself. It's just a matter of taking the time to do it. Uh, but then normally I'll meet with my clients multiple times per year, as opposed to every single month like you do and address any needs they have. And they'll come to me with any adjustments in that plan. And because I have this master plan built, I can essentially make projected like adjustments to that plan and say, okay, this is how it's going to affect things. And these are some changes we need to make. Let's now go implement those changes again. Uh, and so that's really the structure of what I do, which admittedly I'd say mine is um, a more old school or traditional way of doing it. And yours is much more of the coaching model. Mine more is, is much more like the financial advice model. Not that those are technical terms or any one quotes them like that, but I, I, I don't know. Does that make sense? Would you kind of agree with that? Yeah. I mean, my thing is, uh, so I come out, so this comes purely out of the stuff in adult learning that I've done. I just think people get overloaded way too fast. I, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. You know, I've done the big plan like you're talking about and, and like, it just doesn't, doesn't make changes. So the way I look at it, it's the difference between education and learning. The plan is education. Here's a document. Cool. Learning says you change something in your behavior or in what you're doing. Sure. It's just not always the case. You know, I've, I, I'll talk with somebody, we'll have an idea, we'll create it in a plan, and it might take a couple months before they are comfortable with it and making the change. Sure. So I'm working through them throughout the process, and, and it's a bit more of a, I don't know, concierge service. You know, if, you know sure. we're meeting regularly, working through, and, and it's, it's just a different approach. You're right. right. Mine's the newer. Um, the advice only, there's only... A uh, small number of us out there doing advice only as a model um, growing, but it's just, it's, definitely a little, it's a little different. Right. Yeah. And then I think the other thing that's interesting is the way you do it is your clients bring the agenda to the table. Is that right? Most of the time they're kind of so, bringing. Yeah. The way I say it is they bring one or two things and I bring one or two things. Oh, so, so, so you got to co-create that. Yeah, the, nobody ever wants to talk about taxes or insurance. Oh, so you got to bring that up. <laughs> I got to bring those. Like, like, oh, that's a great topic, but we also need to talk about it. Cool, like, yeah. You know, so it, it, what I try to do, um, the way I explain to people is, um, my job is to worry for people. So right. I'm looking for these red flashing lights of problems. And if I see one, we're going to swerve and we're going to go that direction. But otherwise, we will follow their, you know, okay, I'm working on this and Usually what happens, you, you see this too, is people reach out because they have a reason. Correct. You know, I'm worried about long-term care. I'm worried about my investing. I'm worried about, and it's usually about one or two issues. Correct. I'm like, we can definitely do that, but you have these other things you have to worry about yeah, too. You, you didn't know that you have these four other things that could be cleaned up a bit. And those are important too. Well, and, and even a simple one. So each month I have different topics I work on and come October-ish is time for employee benefits. Right. Open enrollment. Let's look at those because you're going to pay that for the rest of the rest of the year. Right. You know, let's look at your health insurance. All becomes part of your plan. And people go, mm -hmm. well, but I thought we were just talking about investments. Well, if I save you money on your, you know, options in your employee benefits, then you have more money to invest in stock or whatever else it is. Right. Or debt or other things. So it's just a matter of working that through with each person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do like that you kind of co-create the agenda. You bring the things that no one will bring up and they bring the pain points that they're having and you have a really good discussion around those items. And then you give the homework like you've talked about, give them a couple things to read or maybe something to look into or 
oh, they didn't, you know, you, you brought up insurance and they don't really know exactly what their insurance coverage was on their thing. Then all right, go look that up and bring it to me or whatever it is. And I think that is a really good structure. And to your point, it's much more of the accountability coaching structure to where they have nowhere. I mean, it sounds terrible to say this, way, but they have nowhere to hide, right? They're going to have to come see you again in a few weeks and, and you're going to sit there and say, so how did it go this last month? And there is that kind of constant in the back of their mind. And I think that's how people do have behavior change, right? If you don't talk to your client for a year, they're not going to have done anything in a year. You know, it's going to stay the same, no behavior change. So I think it, that is more. It's absolutely amazing to me how many people get their homework done about two days before the meeting. Like Everyone, all, of a sudden, sure. all of a sudden, oh yeah, all those documents are uploaded and I did this and I did that. And I'm like, uh-huh. Yeah. So it's not that I'm like, you know, over there going, oh, you didn't do so well. But it's like, we know we're going to talk to Dr. J about this. So therefore, you know, we need to like, For, yeah, have actually done it. It's positive peer pressure, man. I like it. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's a, a, a really like kind of a newer school structure. Again, advice only. You don't get the plan up front, but you're resolving issues as people can digest them, understand them, and move on to the next thing. And I think that is definitely a way. And when you're fully educating to have people kind of, you know, take that on their own at some point or get a better grasp of how to do it themselves over time, that's a great way to go about it. And I still think that my way is yeah, more, more old school of, again, more of like the technical advice of, and I'm not saying I deliver more technical advice, but more of there are things we're going to do. I'll check in with you and kind of work with you. And I, I'd admittedly say I deliver a plan and then I check in six weeks later and continue to handhold throughout the process to see what they've been implementing, what they haven't been. I give recurring uh, updates on like what's been completed, the status of every item, stuff like that, because I think we can both agree implementation is the biggest hump in financial planning where I don't remember what the stat is, but some massive number of recommendations never get implemented because planners don't continue to help clients implement them. And so I think whatever that is, you want to see if a planner has a structure in place to help move along all the recommendations they make an accountability partner of some kind and a process to make that happen effectively. And, and it's part of that question of fit. Correct. You know, I mean, and not, it's not that one option is better than the other. It's just what fits you in your situation. That's True. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, and this is the great thing is people have different models. So it's another question to ask, like, well, what's your process? How does that work? Um, how often do you meet with your clients? Things like that are important because, and, and I'm sure you've experienced this, Dr. J. Some clients are the clients that say, call me when my tax forms are due. Don't bother me otherwise. And some clients are like, okay, great. What time are we meeting next week? And you're like, that's a lot of meetings. I guess 50, 52 meetings a year. Uh, and again, some clients like to have more of that um, recurring, pretty frequent meetings and others just want you to handle it for them and you know, let them know if something came up basically. So I think, yeah, whatever the fit is makes sense um, and, and go from there. And, so and if you're more on the handle it forum program, call Matt, seriously, you know, because yeah. he's going to do more of that than I am. Right. I'm going to more help you to handle it. And, right. and it's not saying one's right. It's just saying right. they're different approaches, you know, and, and you know, it, it, that one person you're talking about, the person says, Hey, call me when my tax file, that's not my client. That's not my, True. my, you know, just not going to fit well. Right. Yeah. And I would say uh, like your structure is continuing to be in contact with people all like very frequently monthly. Right. And then for me, I would say uh, I probably meet with my clients via like actual meeting three to four times a year. Um, and then we'd have like email interactions and things like that multiple times between each meeting. So every few, few weeks for every four to six weeks, probably trading emails. And those emails are oftentimes me saying something like, Hey, this has gotten completed for you. Also, I sent you a DocuSign, so you're going to need to sign that. That's going to open up this account that we were talking about to allow us to do this, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm like continuing to keep them updated with things, but they're very much more like the hands-off, you handle it. And again, as much as they want to know, I'm happy to, to show them. And again, to be clear, I'm not, there's no like hiding of things. They're just, they're the outsourcing people who just say, do this for me. Let me know what I need to sign. What do we need to do? And they, and they move on typically. So I actually, I've never thought of it between our models that way, but I would definitely think more so that way um, is, is kind of how it works. And especially because I also take on the investment management that, you know, people who are doing their own investments are typically going to be more do it themselves as much as they can. Well, yeah. And the, the literature in the financial world will talk about it as a delegator model is where you are, Matt. 
right. they delegate to you to for you to do it. Cool. Mm. They don't delegate to me. No. I don't take over any accounts. I don't do any. Nope. Instead, I teach them how to do it themselves. So Correct. that same, hey, creating an account, we may just sit there and go ahead and create it while we're meeting. Like, right. you know, right. I'll tell them what to fill and what it, you know, oh, we got to make some investment decisions. Let's do that. You know, let's right. log into your investment account. And right. You're going to click the buttons and you're going to do it, but you're going to do, you know, the, the rule I follow investments is you only invest in things you understand. Right. If you don't understand it. We're not doing it. You know, so it's not like the, uh, you know, trust the wizard behind the screen. You know, it's just, we do it. I think right. the other thing to keep in mind, and this is just kind of a little difference in now we're in 2022. Most financial planners are meeting via Zoom now. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter where you are. Correct. You know, I have, I've never met with a uh, client across my desk. Um, this is my house. So, you know, if you want to come hang out, it's fine. But um, me, all right, I'm heading down. You know, I got a lake so you can jump right in. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's everything's online now. So it doesn't matter what state where, you know, you know, yeah, I happen to have my house being is in Mississippi and Matt's in Colorado, but we serve people all across the U.S. Correct. Yeah, that's the great thing is really being able to find the advisor that's the perfect fit for you, regardless of where they are. I think I've only met with one client in person because they requested it and they work a mile from my place and they had an office space for us to meet in. Um, but outside of that, I think I'd say half my clients are in what we call the front range, which is Denver, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, like all this area up and down. Boulder, and I haven't. I've only met with one, and that's it. Everyone else is still Zoom, even though we live you know, three miles away, five miles away. Uh, so yeah, you can also find people across the country who do the job phenomenally well. Uh, okay, so we've talked a lot about like what we do, why what we do is probably what a lot of people want to find just from like uh, aligning yourselves with your advisor. But there are other models as well. Is there something that? like people would want to look out for to avoid that you would say, or like any verbiage that they use that you'd be like, Ooh, start asking questions or something like that. that comes yeah. To so mind. you'll see um, one of the fun ones is fee based. Right. Yeah. Which is like kind of saying like, well, you charge me something, but I also make money elsewhere. And mm. I'm like, not really fee only, but I'm uh, no, you realistically stick with, only fee only fiduciaries. That's that's right. the the important thing. You know, which models matter or less. You'll hear also hear things like robo advisors, which do just more of the investment management side, mm. but that's just the investment management side. Um you know, and sometimes you, they'll kick out like fairly basic, like increase your savings to 10% of your salary or something like that. Yeah. You know, they'll they'll do very basic things like that uh, as well sometimes, generic recommendations. You know, I, I think that the, the the challenge is more of just finding somebody that can, somebody who can help you improve your finances. Mm -hmm. So, if, so if they can, great. And you trust them, great. Um, it's it's just one of those, you know. There, and by the way, there's a whole lot of websites you can look at things, you know. So we are both uh, members of XY Planning Network. They have mm -hmm. giant list of fee only fiduciaries there, all by niche. There's also fee only network, NAFA.org. You can look at all different types. I think. The child-free question is a big one. Um, Correct. That, yeah. That's one of those you got to ask. Um, the other one for the child-free folks, I'm just going to call this out, is how do they protect your privacy? Correct. So there's no attorney-client privilege with a financial planner. So we're in a post-row world. So you want to make sure you know how they are protecting your privacy, especially around reproductive rights, mm -hmm. uh, as part of their uh, as part of the plan. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I go out of my way to do this, and I've actually had to restructure my company and do different things in order to protect that. Um, it's just one of those concerns you want to make sure you, you're addressing. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And again, yeah, uh, you know, I still think if you're child free, having people with child free expertise is really important. But again, like we said before, whatever you most identify with as well in terms of maybe you're an Air Force pilot or whatever it is. So uh, there are multiple things to consider, but you definitely want to have an advisor who understands your situation and ideally has whatever your specific situation is, they should likely also be of that demographic. So I know the advisor that I know that serves Air Force pilots is a former Air Force pilot. So he understands the world um, that, that they're all coming from. Um, I'd say the only other thing that I would be wary of typically is if someone says the word guaranteed, it's a four letter word in finance, uh, and you should start asking a lot of questions if someone says the word guaranteed. Um, and it usually is 
is something to be aware of. Or if someone, if you ask them what their fees are and they say, oh, I don't know exactly what the fee will be on this or something like that, probably run for the hills or at least consult someone who can figure out what that fee is going to be. It's, it's, you know, it's never going to be good if someone's selling you something and they don't know how much it costs. So. Yep. And I think my other caution is the advice is worth what you pay for it. Sure. So we're in an internet world right now. So Matt and I do this podcast and we are very deliberate about what we can and cannot say. And we are very heavily regulated. Um, we don't give personal advice on this. We don't, yeah, you can go on TikTok and people are giving, you know, buy the stock. I'm like, oh, God, right. you're just kill me. Right. Um, so um, the way I explain to people is you pick one recipe. So mm -hmm. whatever financial planner you want to follow or financial book you want to follow, whatever, do that one. Don't mix them. Um, and be careful with what you pick up on the internet. There are some great sources. And then there are some others that just are shocking. No clue what they're doing. Shocking. Um, and how they how they legally do it. I have no clue. And it's probably because they haven't got caught yet. I mean, it's just, it just is what it is, but right. just be careful to find a recipe and make sure they're legit. What you're going to find is those people that are registered investment advisors aren't on TikTok giving stock advice because we can't. Right. Uh, you know, that, that would be really bad. Right. Um, so that means the people on TikTok giving stock advice, and I'm not just paying on TikTok, it could be Instagram or whatever you want, um, are not investment advisors. Mm -hmm. And who knows what's going on. Right. Yeah. So just be aware of where you're getting your information, but there are a lot of different sources out there. Um, admittedly, I'm perfectly fine doing this. And I've done this for people who were thinking of hiring me and then didn't. You don't have to think about hiring me, but if you're looking at hiring, so I'm going to go, I can't really tell if this person's good or not. Uh, I know I'm perfectly fine giving you the, the smell test. You can, uh, you know, email us at childfreepodcast at gmail.com, or you can find Dr. J on childfreewealth.com. You can find me on anthrofywealth.com uh, and any of those, you'll be able to get uh, in contact with us. And we're happy to say, you know what, this person I'll probably be able to give you the pros and cons of working with, with whatever, whatever professional you find. So um, it's, it's tough to see what's, what's good and they intentionally make it a bit murky out there when they're trying to sell their services. So we're, we're happy to give you second opinions uh, as well. So any final thoughts on our, on our long episode here about choosing an advisor, Dr. J? You know, you can learn on your own. It's a question of, is it worth it? You know, is it worth paying somebody to teach you or is it worth you learning on your own? It's okay either way. Um, you don't have to have a financial planner, but it's probably going to move you along faster and keep you out of those unknown unknowns or, or just step in a pothole. And final thought, it's a great question to ask. You can ask a financial planner, do I, am I going to have to work with you forever? And if they say yes, they're probably not a great fit for you. Yeah. I can probably teach you out of having to work with them. Uh, cool. Well, thanks again for, for joining us, uh, listening into the podcast today. Give us any questions you have about this, because I know this is a very confusing topic. Again, childfreepodcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, we'll be back next week. Thanks so much. Child Free Life and Money is an educational and entertainment podcast only. For further disclosure, look at our websites at www.anthrofywealth.com or www.childfreewealth.com. Either way, consult with your financial planner to see if anything we discuss pertains to you. Thanks for listening.